Morgan, everybody. Lance Russell and Dave Brown right along ringside. By golly, we're about ready to go with more big action. Thank you very much, and welcome to Georgia Championship Wrestling. I'm Gordon Sully, your host, and we have quite an hour in store for us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Championship Wrestling at ringside. This is Vince McMahon, along with wrestling's only living legend, Bruno Sammartino. Welcome to this week's edition of Mid-South Wrestling Television. I'm your host, Boyd Pierce, another outstanding card. Hey, guys, and welcome back to another edition of the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. Hello, everyone. I am your host, Ray Russell, and this week, I'm happy to announce it's been a while, but we're bringing him back onto the show. Memphis wrestling super fan slash historian Steve Crawford going to be here in just a minute's time, and we're going to kind of recap some of the stuff that me and Gene Jackson have been talking about in the first couple months here in the Memphis Territory, but we're also going to expand on that. We're going to discuss the upcoming departure of the Macho Man Randy Savage off to the World Wrestling Federation. Plus, Steve has just recently attended the Wrestling Legend Fan Fest that took place in Evansville, Indiana. Going to share some inside scoops there as well. All of that and so much more this week. Plus, bonus material. Stay tuned on the other end. This is an all-Memphis episode, guys. First, Steve Crawford. And then after that interview, we're going to bring back Russell Copia's very own Gene Jackson to talk even more Memphis wrestling on the other side of the program. So stay tuned for that. But before we get to Gene, let's bring him back. Just as promised, here he is. Welcome back, Steve Crawford. It's been a while, brother, but happy to have you back here on Regional Wrestling. Hey, glad to be here. Oh, my God. Glad to have you back. It's been a while, man. And uh, I know you've uh, had done some fun things. So we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute, man. But how you been? How's life? Oh, man, life couldn't be better. You know, I'm I'm retired. And so I get up every day and decide what my day is going to be. and a lot, of, a lot of days it's like, hey, let's watch some Memphis wrestling. So, uh, you know, I'm, nice. I'm a blessed person. Yeah, you, you are blessed if you can use the uh, sentence that I wake up and decide what my day is going to be. I remember those <laughs> yes. days. Uh, I was a teenager last time I was able to do that, Steve. So I, <laughs> right. I, look, forward, exactly. I look forward to you know, a few years down the road, man. Hopefully I can uh, be in the same boat at some some point in time. But right now it's uh, dealing with the kiddos. It's the end of the school year and uh, got orchestra I, my, my daughter corrected me the other day i said i had a band concert she said dad i'm an orchestra i said okay so orchestra Whoa. concerts and choir concerts and sport things and kids are graduating to different levels and whatnot so a lot of craziness going on with that right now yeah re- retirement's kind of like a second childhood it's just you don't have the energy that you had in your first childhood that's the only <laughs> bad part so. well a little wiser though i would hope yes exactly <laughs> work smarter not harder so yes. uh Man, Steve, I guess, uh, you know, last week I was, I hit you up and we've been talking for a few weeks now about getting you back on the show. And you said, I am leaving. I'm going to be going off to, uh, the wrestling convention that just took place in Evansville, Indiana, one of the old stomping ground cities for Memphis wrestling. We talked a little bit about it online, but I was curious, man, just, uh, you want to share your time uh, at the event here on air? Yeah, it was, it was a really good event. Uh, Jeff Osborne put that together. He was, he's a long time Memphis wrestling fan who's from Evansville and a lot of the old Memphis cast and crew were there. Jimmy Hart, Jimmy Valiant, uh, downtown Bruno, Ricky Morton, Bobby Fulton, Bill Dundee, Jamie Dundee, which was interesting, you know, different guys from, from the, uh, Memphis territory. And so the, the the first night they had they had like this long list of video tributes from everybody from you know Bret Hart, Jake's the Snake, Roberts, Chris Jericho. Hey, Lol, you're the king, you're the best, we love you, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and then they had uh, a number of people get up, and I, by the end of the night, you thought Lawler created water. You know, it was like. Nice. Wow. Ricky Morton, there wouldn't have been a Rock and Roll Express without Jerry Lawler. Downtown Bruno, I wouldn't be alive if it weren't for Lawler. Uh, Jimmy Hart, there'd be no Jimmy Hart if there hadn't been, you know, all, all these sort of, you know, platitudes and things like that. Keep on dancing, uh, baby. Exactly. <laughs> the, the, the highlight of the, the the first night was really um, Shane Russell, the son of Lance Russell. Okay. He talked about, yeah, how, you know, he, he first didn't like Lawler when he saw his TV character and then he met him and what, what a great guy he was, how important it was for him that Lawler, you know, later in life, he went to the Cauliflower Alley Club with Lance when, when Lance was getting inducted into that. Mm-hmm. And he was there for the funeral for Lance, and that was really meaningful for him. 
And then the, the, the cool thing about the end of the night, um, there were different presentations and different speakers. But uh, Shane Russell got back up and he said, you know, I was going through a lot of my dad's possessions. And he had some of the original artwork from the 1960s when Jerry Lawler was just a teenage fan. Wow. Yeah. His first introduction into wrestling was was drawing pictures from the matches and sending it into the TV studio. Right. And Lance would use them on screen to describe the action. And, and Shane had some of those original drawings, which were incredibly good shape for, for things that were that old. Wow. Okay. Uh, so that was just a really cool moment to see that's, that. Yeah, that's pretty damn cool. Hopefully there's some pictures or video of some of those pictures out there. That would be pretty, pretty awesome to see, man. I'm sorry I missed that. As you were describing that, man, I had a little chill go up in my spine just thinking about, yeah. the, you know, going back the history of those, the meaning of those pictures. A lot of people don't probably know that that's how Jerry Lawler got his quote unquote start in the wrestling business. Just being an artist as a kid, a teenager, sending in pictures to Lance in this TV studio. And, and like you said, Lance Russell would use them on TV. Ah, oh, while well, he beat the tar out of them. And then he would show a picture <laughs> and, and it was, it was Jerry's pictures. And that's kind of like, Hey, this kid's got, you know, got a knack. Let's uh, see what we can do with him. And eventually it evolved obviously down the line. Right. Right. And, and I mean, Lawler's looking at one of the pictures and he starts reminiscing about the blue infernos and the, how they were his favorite tag team. Uh, and, and so, so that was, that was a really cool moment. Lawler really didn't get a speech himself. Um, uh, but he seemed incredibly happy to be there. He seemed uh, very open and accessible. I didn't have any action with Lawler during the weekend, but, uh, there were huge lines for, you know, autographs and pictures and things. Like that. <laughs> and, and yeah, he seemed to, he seemed to be having a really good time. So, well, so good for him. Good for the King. One good more. for the King. But yeah, it was, it was a fun event. The highlight for me, I got my picture taken with uh, Mick Foley. Uh, the first night Mick gave a little speech and he talked about there were a lot more people in the room at this convention than there ever were at the Evansville Coliseum to see him wrestle. Okay. And uh, <laughs> he, he talked about how, how minute those 1988 paychecks were. So uh, I uh, when I sat down with Mick, I was, I was <laughs> close to the first of the line and with, he, he had a huge line immediately. And I said, Mick, I'm, I'm really glad you're finally making some money in Evansville. So he, he got a little laugh out of that. <laughs> That was a nice little moment, but uh, I think it, one of the things I was sharing it came with you on full circle. <laughs> yes, but you know, the Hardy Boys were there. They had huge lines for autographs and pictures all day. Mick did, Jerry Lawler, of course. But it was really interesting. The 1980s WCW guys, like you know, Steiner Brothers were there. Uh, Lex Luger was there. Ron Simmons was there and, and no interest at all. I mean, they're just sitting there kind of with scowls on their faces, it's, watching people walk. It's kind of crazy. I, I guess, I guess wrestling fans are fickle and different breeds from different eras and whatnot. And I get some of them were there to see the old Memphis guys, but I don't know, man, I feel like if I'm walking in there, I'm going to go over to Lex Luger or the Steiners before I worry about the Hardy boys, but I'm probably going to get heat for that. But I'm just, yeah. it was, it was my era, you know, it was more my era. Right. And, and, and I guess, you know, a lot of people my age who've been to a lot of these wrestling conventions, you know, I've, I've gotten pictures in the past with Valiant and Hart and all those guys. So right. I didn't really feel the need to do any of that again. But I guess, they, you know, to a lot of the younger people, it's just the next generation and the Hardy Boys kind of represented that. But, right. Uh, no, I, t I totally were, get it. I mean, they, they I, I don't want to say were, but they are stars. They were stars. They were part of that attitude era. They had a, a shit ton of great matches during that period with the Dudleys and Edge and Christian yes. and everything down the line. So I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying me going back yeah. in time, my era, my world, I, I think I would have, but again, like you said, you know, I think it's because I, I was, the Hardy boys were more attainable, you know, over the last 20 years for me, 25 years for me, than that I was, you know, when we were growing up, we weren't able to just walk down the street and say, eh, I need a Lex Luger autograph this week or something like <laughs> right. that. So it's, it's a right. little, the world's a little different now. We interact with them on social media. It blows my mind. I have these conversations that, you know, I tell my brother about, and he's like, remember when we were like 10 and, you know, these guys, we couldn't even touch them. Like they were just on TV screen. And now you just have these casual conversations with them on social media. Like, I know it's, it's crazy. You never would have thought that, you know, back then. Yeah. And Jeff actually ended Friday night with a concert and that was like a separate ticket. And I, I didn't stay for that, but there, but there seemed to be plenty of people who were actually pretty excited about seeing Jeff perform that night. So I'm, I'm drawing a blank Jeff Hardy. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, teach their own. Yeah, I, I'm okay. not familiar with his music at all, but <laughs> I, I was like, I, uh, I kind of, 
I, I'm not familiar either, Steve, and I, I kind of get an idea of what it might be. So not my cup of tea. <laughs> Right. That's, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking. But, you know, if I were a 35 year old female, maybe I'd felt it. Sure. I don't know. Sure. That's very, it's possible. Very possible. It's, but man, it is anyway, it, very good event. It uh, sounds fun to Jeff Osborne. You know, he I, I know he spent a lot of time. There are I think the entire Friday night is is online on YouTube. Oh, OK. He did a really good video uh, at the end of the evening, which was kind of about the Mid-South Coliseum and and it featured, you know, a lot of the stars that had come through the territory at different times. And at the end of the interview, he had a picture of Lance later in life, smiling real big and kind wow. of standing and pointing at the Mid-South Coliseum. And it was just a great visual image to end the evening with. That is some kind of great. I don't mind to tell you that. That's <laughs> that's pretty awesome. I think you sent me something like a link to the video or something. I just haven't watched it yet. I got to go check check some of this stuff out. I'm sure it's uh, plastered everywhere and I just I've missed it thus far. But that just sounds fun because when we when it, when I first heard about it, I didn't have high expectations in regards to it was Evansville, you know, and no no diss on Evansville, but it wasn't Memphis. So I'm like, is everybody going to be there? Blah blah blah. But you see all the names and all the people, the, the turnout that they they had, man. It sounds like it was a, a fantastic time. And uh, yeah. I just, I just recently went to GrappleCon for Barry Rose and Nick Massey down in Orlando, so I got my fix of a wrestling convention recently, my first one ever. And uh, this would have been a fun one, too. And Evansville isn't super far. You know, I'm, I'm in Ohio. So that could have been right. a trip I could have made. So I'm kicking myself in the butt right now. Yeah, uh, it was. I mean, some of the people didn't. I mean, Austin Idol no showed. I guess he let him know like two or three days in advance. Imagine he was that, gonna, darling. Gotta imagine keep, that. Gotta keep Got to keep the gimmick, man. <laughs> Dutch, yeah. Dutch Mantel said he couldn't travel for health reasons. I, you know, I, Steve Kern was there and Steve wasn't part of the you know, telling Lawler how great he was on Friday night. And if you've read Steve Kern's book, you'll know why. <laughs> but uh, I, I thought it would have been great if Stan Lane would have been there too. But I didn't I didn't even know Steve was there. I left on Saturday before he actually arrived. And oh, then okay. My friend Brian Trammell was telling me he helped Steve set up his gimmick table and everything. So That's cool. Boy, that yeah. wouldn't have been cool to see Stan and Steve together, though. We always see those. For a while there, there was those Midnight Express reunions when Bobby Eaton was still around and Cornette was making right. trips. And the, and those popped up here and there, but nobody really mentioned. What about a fabulous ones reunion? You know, Stan and Steve would have been a cool time because it sounds like all the stars came out, the ones that can make it anyway. Yeah, it, you know, for that crowd, it would have been really important. Brian Trammell was telling me he said you just could not believe the way some of these older women were looking at Steve Kerr. <laughs> you know, they had their memory bank of the fans <laughs> from 1983, <laughs> and uh, it was visually expressive on how they thought about Steve, I guess. So. Awesome. You Good know, time. Yeah, Good absolutely. Time. Sounds like a blast, man. Uh, again, it wasn't that far, so I'm kind of kicking myself in the butt. And my wife, she doesn't really follow wrestling. She respects it. And, you know, she understands, you know, my love for the history of it. Uh, but I don't really have to twist her arm to get her to go on road trips. That's just the fun for her. Like, oh, a, a new restaurant or bar, a new site to see. Uh, we're seeing the road somewhere different. So, it's not much for me to have to make force her to drag her along with me for some of these trips. So uh, it yeah. kind of sucks now that, that I missed out, but it sounds like a fun <laughs> time and God bless Austin. Idol keeping the gimmick alive, darling. After all there these you years. Go. <laughs> yeah. I'd never been to Evansville. And then I went and had lunch with a friend from Owensboro, Kentucky. And okay. you know, that part of Kentucky was actually very beautiful. So it, it was actually as a road trip. It was, it was a really nice road trip as well. That's awesome. Well, last time we had you on the show, we talked Memphis wrestling. Imagine that. Uh, we were setting the stage for my 1985 project. Uh, me and Gene Jackson have been breaking it down week by week, just kind of dissecting the territory, the house show results, the TV, and everything in between. The Jerry Lawler shows, having some fun with some of those and some of the yeah. guests. So we kind of closed out 1984. We looked at some of the things that were going on heading into the new year, things to expect coming into the new year. And uh, I thought this would be a good time to kind of recap what's been happening here in the early part of 1985 Memphis territory. We could touch on some things here that I have in front of me, uh, some notes I took for the show, and then uh, anything else you might want to expand on as well. Sure thing. Sounds like fun. Awesome. So very first topic I want to discuss is a guy by the name of Jimmy Hart, Mr. Beans and Taters himself, <laughs> Jimmy Hart has been in the pr promotion for years at this point, right? He's been the right. lead heel for lack of a better term. He's a manager, but nobody hated more than Jimmy Hart off and on. Of course, the former manager of Jerry Lawler before he broke his leg. And then basically for the last five years, it's been the Alliance to end 
Jerry the King Lawler, Jimmy Hart right. trotting everybody out, you know, even aligned himself with Andy Kaufman and whatnot. But uh, unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Jimmy Hart gets that call or, or what, however you want to look into it. We'll talk about, I'll, I'll let you elaborate a little more on the stories you've heard about this, but Jimmy Hart basically heads off to New York to go work for Vince McMahon right before the very first WrestleMania. And of course he appears on the very first WrestleMania as well, which is crazy to think where he was managing the Terminators just a few <laughs> weeks prior. So it's, um, it's amazing the, the change in career here for Jimmy Hart, but I was going to get your take as a Memphis wrestling fan of the time. What did it mean to lose Jimmy? And uh, then we'll get into maybe some of the stories you've heard, the versions you've heard of Jimmy leaving for Vince McMahon. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's a couple of places that Jimmy's kind of chronicled this a bit. He he talked about it in the movie Memphis Heat, the documentary. Mm -hmm. And if you've seen that, they kind of portray Jimmy leaving as kind of the end of Memphis wrestling, which, you know, it wasn't, but that was a good time to kind of wrap up that story for that documentary. Right. And then he also, he also wrote about it in his book. And one of the things that cracked me up in the, in the documentary was, you know, he talked about, you know, Vince McMahon had flown him up. Vince McMahon said, we want you here before WrestleMania one. So that wasn't by accident. Right. Uh, but he said, well, I, I told Plowboy Frazier, well, I think I'm going to quit this wrestling and go back into the music business, get the gentrifuge <laughs> back together again. <laughs> and the thing that was not, that was left unsaid in, in the documentary was he, he knew that Fla Frazier couldn't wait to run to Lawler and tell him, right. right. To stooge him out on that. <laughs> so Lawler comes to him and says, are you going back in the music business? And Hart says, no, nah, I can't lie to you. Uh, I, I'm going to go work for the, for Vince McMahon. Uh, he said, you know, Lawler actually threatened him with a lawsuit at that time, which was ridiculous because there were no contracts for territory, sure. you know, and at that time he didn't say this in the Memphis heat, documentary but in his book he basically said i got out of there before anyone could hurt me <laughs> yeah because, you know he had had the instance when lawler came back and he was upset about hart's turn and the way it was done and and he had broke hart's jaw yeah yeah and it the, the stars aligned <laughs> the last saturday that hart was in memphis both Jerry Jarrett was out of town and Jerry Lawler was out of town. So yeah, Hart was actually Lawler, running Lawler and TV Valiant today. were gone to Japan. Right. Yeah. Right. So Hart, you know, wrote the script for him to dump the, the flower <laughs> on Lance Russell and quote, get suspended. And then they, you know, they did that bizarre uh, video where Hart's like it is home or somewhere. Yeah. 12 minutes. Yeah. I think it was, or something like that. Just kind of talking yeah. in circles. Yeah, you can tell when it's really long like that, you can tell Jerry Jarrett is behind the production. He would, Jarrett would just do some really long videos like that. It's just, it's just like, okay, let's wrap this thing up. Let's kill some but, time. You know, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, as a Memphis wrestling fan, once cable started, you know, in 1982, you didn't know there was better wrestling in the world than Memphis wrestling. You, you didn't know that there were bigger stars than. Lawler and Dundee and, and, you know, those people on those right. programs. Yeah. But by 1985, you knew that Memphis wrestling was, was no longer, you know, a major league territory anymore. And it was, it was and kind of exposed. Kind of, I get it. Yeah. And then, yeah. and, and heart leaving just kind of cemented that. I mean, I, I think, you know, when, when people talk about the best managers ever, yeah, I don't think Hart belongs in that conversation, but if you were just looking at that run he had right. from the time he turned to the time he left, I think that was one of the strongest manager runs that's ever been. He had no good qualities. You know, you could look at Bobby Heenan and, and Cornette wow. and say, okay, they did these terrible things, but the guys also crack you up with one liners and things right. like that. Yeah. But, but Hart was just, you know, when he was on top, he's just arrogant and he's just laughing in your face. And when the tables are turned, he's just the crying victim and he would backstab anybody at any moment. There were just nothing like you could say, oh, well, he's this awful person, but he has these good qualities. You couldn't say that with Hart. He was right. just awful in every imaginable way. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think it, you know, just cemented the fact that, yeah, that, you know, this, this, this territory is not going to be what it was in the future. I think that was very well said the way you broke down Jimmy Hart as a manager there. Like he had one of the strongest runs of any manager ever in the history of wrestling really here during this uh, Memphis run. And even the very early 
Jimmy Hart and the WWF had a lot of Memphis tones to it. You know, it was more dark or, or more evil. You know, it eventually became the cartoon character uh, <laughs> running around, jumping around with the different uh, jackets and the, obviously the megaphone and whatnot. But at first, he seemed to have a little bit of that Memphis still in him. It, it, and I'm sure there was conversations behind the scenes that got him to lighten up and become more of the uh, the, the for the kids type heel manager type deal there in uh, New York. But yeah, there's nothing quite like a, a Jimmy Hart era here in the Memphis territory. And I've had people tell me when we started posting the videos, the end of Jimmy Hart's time here in the, the company, there were a lot of fans who grew up on it that said this was the end of Memphis wrestling for me. So I kind of get what yeah. you're talking about with that, you know, documentary. Now, obviously Memphis went on and there's a lot of great fun stuff that still happened, you know, over the next several years, the big Lawler idol, Tommy rich stuff. Uh, I always love when Bam Bam Bigelow would run through there. All sorts of cool things that ha still go on for many years to yeah. come here, but uh, it is it is definitely an end of an era, no doubt about it. it with Jimmy Hart gone, they're going to try to replace him. Time it was like Bill Watts trying to replace the dog. You're just not going to do it. It's not going to happen. And there were sadly there were some decent guys who we never saw before or never heard from again that I thought they were kind of okay at least for the Memphis territory. But when everybody's trying to quote unquote replace Jimmy Hart, it just wasn't happening. Right, right. And and, and the the great thing about Hart's position, like you say, he was kind of the lead hill. So any hill that came in, he just had heat because he was aligned with, with this horrible Jimmy Hart person. He didn't have to do anything. I mean, your job's easy. You just send in a tape and say, Lawler, I'm going to, you know, beat you on Monday night and, and ruin the King. And, and he's just automatically hated because he's associated with Jimmy Hart. So it was really easy to get heels over at that time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Just walking instant heat alongside Jimmy Hart, whether people had heard of you or not. But like you said, the times change, uh, you know, national expansion, a lot more people are getting cable or satellite dishes, things like that. They've probably seen maybe Georgia by this point, Crockett takes over there. There's magazines. Of course, there's Vince McMahon expanding. People are getting a look at Madison Square Garden, much larger TV uh, arenas and things. So it's like, wait a minute. I love my Memphis wrestling. I grew up on it. And, you know, I live here. I, I love these guys. But this here looks like a whole nother ballpark. Like, we're, we're, right. <laughs> it's just a exactly. different level. Yeah. I so mean, I, when I first started watching Georgia wrestling and you had Mass Superstar and you had Paul Orndorff and Piper and Don Morocco, and it was like, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. I can, <laughs> and a lot I of those can. guys, you know, went on to, to New York and had really big runs up there. But you could just tell it's just a different level. Did you ever hear, I know Lawler's told this story, but Lawler doesn't really remember a whole lot. He never has. He's never like tried to keep his wrestling career in his memory banks, at least accurately. But right. uh, I'm sure Jerry's told the story about Jimmy Hart leaving. Have you ever heard Jerry's version or is it something not really you recall? Cause I, I don't recall. I listened to all their shoot interviews 20 some years ago, but I haven't listened to them since. So all of this is not any longer in my memory banks. Yeah. I don't recall ever Lawler ever really talking about it very much, to be honest. Mm -hmm. The other thing about it, you know, Hart wasn't just managing guys. You know, he was he was writing songs that would, you know, and, and that they would make into videos. And so, you know, he had, had that element to the show. So, you know, he had such a strong visual presence that made you look at the screen whenever he was on. It was like a guy with preacher hair. You're going to stop when you see <laughs> one of those loud outfits, you know. Let me get your opinion yeah. on something. We, we go back to Jimmy Hart writing that, that uh, episode of uh, Wrestling. For that week, Saturday morning in the studio, and he dumps that bag of flour on the head of Lance Russell. It starts off with him just throwing pinches of flour on Lance and then yeah. eventually leads to him dumping the entire bag of flour, five pound bag of flour, baby, over the head <laughs> of Lance Russell. Let me ask you something. Does Lance Russell deserve an Emmy for his acting skills there or did he not know that that entire bag was coming? I your, don't your opinion. think he really knew the entire bag was okay. coming. Uh, <laughs> Shane Russell even made a reference to that saying, hey, you know, my dad was really mad that you ruined his Baxter suit. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I think it, I think he realized something was coming, but I think he was legitimately ticked off. But uh, so, yeah, you know. I, you, me and Gene were debating, like, is that what Lance Russell looked like when you really got him ticked off? You know, when you when you're. <laughs> <laughs> when you right, made a mess right. in the backyard and didn't clean it up or something, you know, I don't know, but it was kind of interesting to see that version. Expecting that level of humiliation, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was quite the sight to behold. But I tell you what, if Jimmy wanted a natural reaction, he sure got one there. He did. <laughs> you he are did. done and out of here. You are suspended. I just out of whoa, Lance. It was so cool because you always saw Lance. He was an announcer, right? 
And they don't even yeah. tell you that he's in charge that week until the following week. But you don't question it because for some reason, he's such a, a piece of wrestling history there in Memphis that when he suspended somebody, you didn't realize he had that power, but you didn't really question it either, right? It's, <laughs> right. it's like, right. well, Lance did. I guess he could do it. It's Lance Russell. He can do whatever he wants. So yeah. exit yeah. Jimmy Hart. Exit and, Jimmy Hart. And you talk about that interview that he did at home in the front of that fireplace. And uh, boy, they could, they should have lit, lit that on fire because it was a really dark <laughs> dark interview, by the way. Lots of shadows, but um, yeah. uh, they weren't worried about that in Memphis back then. Anywho, so Jimmy Hart says at the end of the promo, there's not going to be any chicanery in this matchup. I won't be ringside. Uh, I won't come back under a hood. I won't come back under an assumed name. There won't be a lookalike. And then we go to the match, and what do we get? A lookalike. Oh, lookalike. <laughs> it's and I, bizarre. It was really weird because Jimmy Hart's overselling. I'm not coming back under a hood. I'm not coming back under a you know false name. There's not going to be some fake looking Jimmy Hart guy. And then that's exactly what we get. A guy who initially is called Tommy Hart. They change his name to T.H. Hart for what reason? I really don't know. Uh, but he's basically a, a taller version of Jimmy Hart, at least his looks. Maybe not so much his promo skills, but... You know, I did digging and digging and digging, and I can't find a damn thing on this guy outside of what we've seen on Memphis TV. And I, I know I asked you prior, but I guess I'll just ask you again to share here your opinions on this T.H. Hart character when you saw it. And also, if you got any information on this guy. I, I have no information. I'm I'm pretty sure that I read a Scott Bowden column years ago. And for people who don't know, Scott Bowden worked as a manager Memphis and then was kind of a Memphis historian. And he said this guy was was just pulled out of the crowd. It was somebody that would come to the Coliseum every week dressed up like Jimmy Hart. Oh. But the thing that's surprising, if that's true, is how active he was in that Eddie Gilbert match because he's choking Lawler when, when the ref's not looking. He's pushing Lawler off the top rope. Right. I mean, they, he's involved. They had a lot of trust these, in him. Yeah. Right. They, to yeah, know his spots. Him involved in all these spots. Which, you know, and, you know, Lawler would do stuff like that. I mean, you know, people would just be thrown into situations and it was kind of a sink or swim deal. Yeah, I, um, I know. I know I, I've seen I, at I, least at least a couple of times so far here in early 85. I'm questioning if a couple of the guys, the job guys were just pulled off the street, literally. So I, I get <laughs> right. what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, they would do that. But uh, quite an overbite on the TA chart. I think I think Freddie Mercury would have looked at that overbite and went, "Oh my God, what's that?" <laughs> pretty remarkable. beautiful, baby, beautiful. But so. yeah, I and I was surprised. I was looking at some Nashville results online, and he actually was working in some of the shots in Nashville too, because I thought now nah, he's probably just you know in Memphis because they kind of pushed him to the back really quickly. I mean, Gilbert was doing kind of the player coach role that he would do later in the UWF. And, mm -hmm. and he was of course, a 10, you know, a thousand times better talker than TH Hart. Right. So they kind of pushed That's him aside sure. very quickly and then forgot about him, but it was just think, a very strange deal. Do you think mentally that was just the King's revenge? Oh, I'll, I'll just find somebody to replace him. He's replaceable knowing that he wasn't obviously Lawler pissed off that Jimmy leaves, but I think in the back of his mind, much like Bill Watts later, I'm covering UWF too, watching all these guys leave for Vince. It's like, yeah, they're, they're pissing you off because they're leaving you. They're, they're leaving you hanging. But at the same time, you you can't really blame them in the back of your mind. You know they're you can't offer them the money they're going to go make or the celebrity that they're going to go have. I don't know. It's just this TH heart pops up so quickly right after Jimmy says, and, and I don't think Jimmy had a clue. He was already gone. You know, he uh, hopped, yeah. in the, hopped on that plane and head off to New York City. So uh, when they came up yeah. with this idea. So I just felt like, is this like a Lawler deal, do you think, where he was just like, Screw Jimmy Hart. I'll, I'll just I'll create a new Jimmy Hart. Obviously, it doesn't yeah, work out. Very positive. I mean, Lawler did so much stuff on the spur of the moment, and and not really thinking like <laughs> the beginning, a plot, and an ending, and and just like you know, hey, let's just put on a show. We'll do this tonight. We'll see what happens. So, right. I, I don't know. I'm amazed that in the internet age, nobody's come forward and said. Oh, hey, I was Tommy Hart. You know, I did right. this in Memphis wrestling. It's just shocking that. No, you know that the person who did this, if he's still alive, hasn't come forward and gotten his, you know, fifteen minutes more fame. Yeah, out of even it. even if they weren't, and they were, you know, a lot, we would check their overbite to see if they were they were seriously <laughs> th hard or not. But at the same time, I, I get you, man. You would have thought over the last twenty years, you know, if if not he, maybe somebody in his family. Hey, my dad or my uncle used right. to used to do this th heart gimmick. 
and what yeah, so it is I mean, really weird I, youtube video and somebody saying oh the guy playing on that son, song was my uncle you know i mean somebody knows who this guy was right but it's been very much a mystery well if anybody's listening out there old memphis wrestling historians or fans if anybody knows anything on th heart please send it our way you can do it on facebook you can send me an email about him wrestlecopia at gmail.com i want to find out more information i'll share it with steve or vice versa guys tell us about th hart i don't have a whole lot he's still there right now he's gonna he's hang around for a few weeks in the memphis territory yeah. tucks newman about to appear though so well we'll see we'll see what happens there but like oh. i said it, it begins the list of managers attempting to replace the spot that was jimmy hart who has now gone off to the world wrestling federation guys speaking of talent leaving soon for the wwf he hasn't gone yet in fact he hasn't appeared one time on studio wrestling in the year of 1985 yet. And I'm in the month of March now. We're heading into the month of March. And that is the Macho Man Randy Savage. Mm, yeah. Savage yeah. is a baby face coming into 85. And he's working all the house shows. He's working all the Coliseum shows. In fact, anytime Lawler wakes up and decides, eh, I don't feel like going to the show today, Savage has been replacing him in the main events. If it's a city Lawler doesn't feel like driving to, Savage is playing Lawler against Eddie Gilbert in barbed wire matches for no reason whatsoever and, and whatnot. So, <laughs> so Macho Man is here. He's working, you know, six, seven days a week, but he hasn't yes. appeared on studio wrestling one time. And I got to ask you, Steve, was there was something behind that? Did you ever hear anything about that? Was it a certain drive that he didn't want to make? Because Macho Man always came up to me as a guy, if he could go on TV and get himself over, he was going to do it. And it's just so odd that we're heading into March now. He hasn't appeared on TV one time. Yeah, I I don't know specifics, but uh, Jeff Walton, who did come in as Tux Newman, you know, he did an interview with Scott Bowden several years ago, mm -hmm. and, and and Jeff was still upset decades later about how low his pay was. Yeah. Every question he was asked, <laughs> he would start a rant on how bad the pay was in Memphis. And according to Jeff, Randy Savage was getting paid a flat six hundred dollars a week in Memphis. So I guess they had some sort of agreement that, you know, so I guess he wasn't paid by each house. You're getting $600 a week was what they agreed to. Now, I know, you know, Savage was living in Lexington during ICW. And my guess is he probably still was afterwards. I know he married Elizabeth in 1984. Mm -hmm. So it's a six hour drive from Lexington to Memphis. And I'm thinking he probably worked a spot show in Kentucky on Friday nights. And he was working Saturday night in Nashville. So why get in the car, drive six hours to Memphis for a two-minute match and a two-minute interview, then drive to Nashville, you know, sit around all day and all evening waiting for your match, and then drive back to Lexington after the match? I think it was – I just think it was probably a logistics issue more than anything. Yeah, that's what, that, you know, that's what I was wondering. Obviously, it's going to change. Savage going to pop back up on the studio here very soon. They got some plans in the works for him. Uh, but it's, we're not yeah. too long before we say goodbye to Randy Savage as well. He's going to be gone by May, May-ish, something like that. And uh, he's off to the WWF as well to go, oh, my God. And if, just if you think about it, 1985, in three years, he's going to be uh, WWF champion, uh, winning it at yeah. WrestleMania, right? And so... But here we go back, just like Jimmy Hart managing the Terminators, which I want to talk to you about the Terminators, too. Uh, remind yeah. me before we go off the air here. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, yeah, so Randy Savage, he's not long for the company at this point. Uh, I don't remember the story with Macho Man. I don't know if you've, you've heard it or, or know it. How long in advance did he know he was leaving? Was it short? Was it quick? Was it like, I'm leaving by? Or, uh, what? you know, did it was yeah. like, hey, i giving well, you my two weeks. i got to drop this belt. I'm out of here. How did it, how did it go? Well, yeah, Hart was the one that paved the way because Vince asked Jimmy Hart, is there any talent, you know, in Memphis I need to pick up? And Hart's response was, yeah, the best wrestler in the world is starving to death in, <laughs> death in Memphis. And he was re referring to Randy Savage. And then after Savage got the offer, you know, first he made sure there was a job for Lanny. And then secondly, he went to, to Jerry Jarrett and said, how long do you need me for? And Jerry Jarrett would later say, Savage was the most honorable wrestler he ever worked with. Okay. And he said, Randy, I just need two weeks. I just need to get the belt off of you and, and go through the loop. Okay. Um, you know, Randy had come from that ICW where he'd been promoting for years. And I'm sure he'd seen a lot of guys walk out on him with no notice and how that messed up his plans. 
he thought like a, both a wrestler and a promoter in, in some ways. But I always think, you know, I was watching that ICW show in, in say, 1982, mm-hmm. and I've never seen any other wrestler go from where Savage was, you know, working these dinky little armories in yeah. high schools on this incredibly poorly produced television show, and then going to Memphis and then becoming an iconic star in the wrestling business. You know, it was just wild to see that progression. It's like anything's possible in wrestling. I talked about this once on probably this show, and it may have been when I had you on last. It seems like that would have made the most sense, but I want to bring it up again here too. I've heard the stories of when Bobby Eaton was first breaking in, his first opponent more often than not on these outlaw shows was Randy Savage. And both of them like to come off the top rope. So they would just go out there and have matches where they would just take turns practicing moves, if you will, doing all these crazy spots over the top rope, off the top rope, out on, outside on the floor. And I just go back and think, okay, well, the storytelling probably sucked psychology wise, <laughs> but could you imagine a young Bobby Eaton and a young Randy Savage just going out there and killing it night after? I would have loved to have seen one of those. Yeah, the, the move Savage did where he would run a po- put an opponent, well, let me try to speak again, sure. an opponent <laughs> into the ropes and he'd go with them and he'd kind of hang the opponent's neck on the top right, rope right, and, and jump Savage over it. would go oh. over to the floor. That, that was a movie picked up from Bobby Eaton. So, yeah, they were they were definitely I can't imagine the, uh, the long-term damage that did on the knees, man. Just <laughs> oh, I can't even imagine. I mean, Savage's knees... Uh, it's amazing he was walking later in his life, coming yeah. off that top road onto those concrete floors every night. Yeah. Just unreal. They were both in the Goulas territory at the very last, you know, the Goulas territory. And then uh, mm-hmm. Sap and his dad started ICW, and then Eaton went to Memphis for the first time. So do you think, I'm just going to ask you, hypothesize here, what do you think would have happened if Vince McMahon said, nope, sorry, Randy, we don't have any room for Lanny? Do you think Macho Man just kind of looks at Dad and feels the the pressure of, all right, I'll stay here and make 600? Or do you think Macho Man might have, you know, and obviously we're just talking hypothetically here. Do you think he would have caved in and said, yeah, bright lights, New York City, thousands and thousands more dollars, royalties. I got LJN figures possibly going to be made. Do you really turn everything down just so Lanny Poffo can get a job as an underneath guy? You know, I don't think he would have turned that down, but I think he would have negotiated for it sooner rather than later, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, I mean, it was very clear from the beginning that Savage was going to be a top guy in the WWF, which was shocking to me. There's all these people that say, Oh, I saw Savage and ICW and I knew he was going to be the biggest thing in the world. Well, I'm the guy that didn't. (laughs) (laughs) I just saw this horrible television production. Yes. They shot a, they shot a show once at the cook convention center in Memphis and the front row of seats was not sold out. I mean, they had six or seven people in the front row and nobody that you could see behind yeah. them at the show. And well, you know, this. when Bob Roop was still wrestling with them, he told stories of uh, sometimes uh, they would just randomly decide or randomly get an open time to film TV and there was no fans. So I don't, yes. I don't know if any of that stuff actually exists on film. But he was talking about we would go and wrestle and have to put on these storylines and things. And, you know, there was not a single fan in the, in the audience or, the, you know, whatever. So that had to be really weird. But, I mean, again, it's ICW and there wasn't anything quite like it. I'll tell you, you know, the no. intro, the intro video. My God, whoever put that together. Amazing. Yes. Because if you saw yes. that, you go, what is that? You know, <laughs> what is that? There's bears and, and fire and I got everything on earth. But the whole thing had just like this cable access show, like a bunch it, of guys. It who, so did. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just one level above backyard wrestling. And so it took me a long time <laughs> to process that, yeah, the Savage is actually really great because right. I just couldn't get beyond everything environmentally that was around him. No, I, t- I, t- I totally get it. You know, if I have another topic I want to discuss, but I know I'm discussing that topic, so I don't want to forget to talk about them. I already mentioned them. So I want to get your, your thoughts or memories or whatever on the uh, tag team called the Terminators. So uh, they pop up, I guess somewhere near the end of 84 and they're somehow still here heading into yeah. March of 1980. They just wrestled the dirty white boys in a loser leaves town match. And you knew, you knew going in Steve that the Terminators were losing that thing. That is until they didn't. And then <laughs> Tony, Anthony and Lynn Denton, they leave town. We can't afford to pay those guys, but, 
Terminators will keep them around. And there's two incarnations I should point out of the Terminators, uh, Riggs and Crow and Riggs and Wolf. This is Riggs and Crow, the original. Crow will wind up going to prison for something at some point. I, I, right. it, well, we were joking on the show. If he went to prison for being a great wrestler, you know, he went for is an innocent man uh, because yeah. they, they were not. But it, it's been some of the most atrocious. I'm, you know, I'm not even trying to be funny here. What some of the most atrocious wrestling on TV that I can't believe they still have jobs at this point. I can't believe that they needed talent that badly. And I use the term talent loosely here uh, to yeah. use these guys week after week on television. I mean, at least just use them at the house shows. And uh, it's, yeah, were it's they been the really same bad. team that Hart had in Georgia, like in 1984, or was that it? Because he had a, like a mass team down there. I remember the team. I think they're different guys because I think I'd heard that the team he had in Georgia were like two Arkansas enhancement guys like, or something, right? Enhancement guys, yeah, right? Yeah. That they take to Georgia and trying to make national stars out of nothing. But yeah, just you know, clumsy, dangerous. You know, guys that just had no business being in the ring whatsoever. And and I've been watching some 83 Memphis. And the thing that's striking is the undercard was filled with these really talented guys that may have just had like three or four years of experience. Mm-hmm. Jesse Barr and, you know, Bobby Eaton, Coco Ware. You could go down the line. Right. Jock Joe was in and out. But, you know, and then you see these guys at this point. And again, that's how you know, like Memphis is really going down that even to the untrained eye, you know, these guys are horrible. Yeah, we have uh, discussed that at length because they're on the TV, like even the week where there was like they were snowed in, there was a blizzard somehow out of like the five people that made it to the studio. The Terminators were unfortunately two of them. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate to have to sit here and go through this week after week. But we came to the conclusion, and you know, I'm not joking here, all j- jokes aside, and all indies aside, all untrained backyard indie feds and things like that, and, and all that kind of stuff aside, if you go back to the territory era, this may be the very worst tag team of that time frame, like as far as yeah. like Memphis, Crockett, George, you know, actual territories. This may be the worst team I've ever seen. Yeah, certainly, you know, a team that got a push and, you know, was put in mm-hmm. programs where they were expected to, to make money and, it, you know, I, I I think sometimes they thought we can train these guys. We can get anybody over. If they've got the basic look, we'll find out what they can do. Well, they find out these guys couldn't do anything. So, you know, and who's, who's wrong. mother, whose mother did the battens screw? Because those <laughs> poor guys were better than almost any t- team they brought through here at this point. And those guys are just jobbed out every week, including to the Terminators. And we just covered that on the last episode we did of Memphis. They do the hot tag spot and the Battens are doing everything in stereo and they go to do the double slide through the legs. And that crow, he has I don't think he's ever seen the spot before. So as the Batten is sliding between his legs, he drops down on him, just sits on him, just sits on him, yeah. doesn't even try to fight him, wrestle. He just sits on him as the uh, spot continues on on the other side of the ring. It was just the most awkward, crazy thing I'd ever seen in a ring. Yeah, and the Battens could have been put into a decent program with some of the other tag teams that they had. I'm with you. I'm kind of amazed at how they just jobbed them out there and and didn't do anything with them at all. They've spent the last three months feuding with the Playboy, at least on the house shows. We don't really get to see that on TV, but it's been the Battens versus Frazier, you know, uh, basically for almost three months now. (laughs) Right. I mean, put them in the nightmares together and you could have some entertaining matches, I'm sure. Sure, sure. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, somebody was just booking them as as a favor and just didn't want to do anything with them, or maybe maybe not even as a favor. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. They needed talent or whatnot, and the Bantons were looking for work at the time. But I, I've I've made the comment. I know how everybody craps on central states, but at this point, man, just take your trip on down there because at least at least you guys will be on top. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be yeah, getting paid was... more than than uh, nothing here on TV in uh, Memphis. Yeah, it was it was ugly. I think I think this was Lawler booking and being really lazy. And I think we're getting about to the time where Tom Ernesto comes in when, yeah. when Jeff Walker comes in. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think things will start making a little more sense and be a little more interesting. Yeah, that's what Gene said to me, because, you know, we've watched so much Memphis wrestling over our lives. We have great fondness and memories of it. But this has been a really rough, like maybe one of the roughest patches in that I can recall in Memphis wrestling, just the talent. And the booking, like you said, the booking doesn't make sense from week to week. And 
it's just been crazy. And it does feel like a very lazy, and that's what I've come to the conclusion of. Lawler's just like, yeah, whatever. We'll figure it out when we get there every week at this point. And he's been in Japan, yeah. and Jimmy Hart's just writing random shows in the middle and whatnot. So, yeah, it's been all over the place. So I'm looking for some <laughs> consistency. And I, I noticed Jeff Walton's about to come in. I know Savage will be back in the studio. So I, I know good things are about to pop. But, man, it's been a rough time getting there, especially b- between the Blizzard and, you know, the stories. Well, you know, a couple, couple of things on Lawler's booking. Lawler would, used to say that he would book the Saturday morning show in his mind on the drive back from his Friday night spot show. Mm. So that's how much time he put into <laughs> putting the format and everything together. And, and Cornette has said, you know, when Lawler was booking, he, he worried about Lawler's program and the rest was just kind of thrown together for entertainment. Right. Sake, right. And know? that's, that's kind of what it, it's, it's, it feels like really. So that totally yeah. makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It, when, when, Jerry Jarrett was there. You get these long storylines and you get this real attention to detail. And, and Lawler was just like, yeah, it'll all work out in the end. Well, it's, it's a show. And it's, it's hard to book TV the next day when you don't know who's even going to show up. Right. So it's like, well, I had this booked in my head last night, but so-and-so's not here. So I guess we'll just throw so-and-so instead in there. And yeah, that that's fine. <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, it doesn't make sense now, Jerry, but it is what it is. And I think we've kind of <laughs> seen that a few times already here in the, 1985 but one feud besides the king that's been ongoing for a while now that we have seen the return of the fabulous ones at least we've been informed they've returned i haven't seen them on actual memphis studio wrestling yet but they do they do return here in a week or two finally to the studio so business is picking up all around and uh that's the fabulous one stan lane steve kern we talked about them we wish they had appeared in evansville unfortunately stan lane (laughs) was not booked and he didn't show up uh, unlike Austin Idol who was booked and, and didn't <laughs> show up. So, anywho, the Fabs are back in the Memphis territory after Jackie Fargo buried them last year. He said the boys have sown their wild oats. They've seen the world and they realize the best wrestling is right here in Memphis and they're back in their second home of Memphis, Tennessee. And then there was a week of TV where the Fabs couldn't bother to show up, but their fathers showed up who don't even live here or wrestle. The Fab fathers of course, uh, Corporal Dick Kern uh, Steve Kern's father and then Stan Lane's father as well uh, get front row seats in the studio and where they are eventually attacked by Troy Graham in a wheelchair <laughs> and his interns and the the feud is on for the tag titles and of course now it's personal and J- Jeff Jerry Jarrett all about you know personal storylines so yeah it got personal really fast but Troy Graham's promos he's always been a great promo but these promos on, on Dick Kern I mean he just singles him out and yeah. they're terrible, but you can't help but laugh at them. You're a big fat <laughs> tub of spit. <laughs> yeah, you shell shocked daddy, Steve Kern. And I yeah. talked about it at the beginning of the feud. I kind of just glanced over Corporal Dick Kern's career in the military because it was a real thing. In fact, he has his own Wikipedia page. That's how, how big deal he was, you know, in the, uh, in the Air Force. And it's crazy. You know, you go look back and, and the guy was a prisoner of war in two separate wars. And you can laugh at ah, this guy's so stupid. I can see the promo now, right? You're so stupid. Your day's so stupid. He, you know, he got captured in two different wars, Steve Kern. But no, in, in all seriousness, the guy was a fighter pilot in World War II. And he was uh, shot down and, and held captive prisoner of war. And again, in Vietnam and Vietnam for nearly eight years, he was tortured before he was released. So you got to think about what this guy went through. And now he's on Memphis wrestling playing pretend here, getting beat up for a heat for his son's program. But it's just crazy. Some of the stuff came out of Troy's mouth. Yeah. You know, I've never been like a big fantasy booker guy, but I just think they could have done so much better with that angle. Mm -hmm. You know, it just seems like if you're going to attack that guy, stretch him out and then, you know, get newspaper clips and tell the story you know, really get into this guy's past and what he's done. And he's a war hero and he's an American patriot. And I just don't think they put that story together very well. I just don't think it had anywhere near the impact that it should have had. You know, I know that, you know, you you do your podcast with Bob Roop and it sounds like in Florida, they kind of went with that same type of angle. Mm -hmm. And it was really huge response to that. Right. And here it just seems like, it just feels like another angle and it just feels like Troy Graham's just spouting off at a different person saying uglier things, but you know, it, it should have felt more real than it felt. 
Well, I think in Florida, you know, Eddie Graham was the master of booking and he did what you said. They told the story of, you know, Dick Kern and his history in the in the war. And so people kind of had an understanding of, you know, where he came from and what he had been through. And then Bob Roop, you know, gives him the shoulder breaker and he gets stretchered out. And Bob's told the story where he had a veteran come up to him in the parking lot and put a gun to his head, you know, because wrestling was real. I mean, that was that was the the heat he was getting. And he had to start kind of watching himself. And he started carrying a gun after that himself because of the story and whatnot, because people really wanted his head for discrediting the war victims, you know, uh, in the United States here, uh, and just giving him a shoulder breaker. And I totally agree with you. I'm sitting here watching this and on paper, you write this out. Oh, he's going to, they're going to attack this. He's going to say these things. And you're like, this is gold. This is money. You guys are going to sell out for six months here, you know, <laughs> or whatever, right. but you're right. They don't do their due diligence to really tell the backstory. It's just, Oh, he's a, you know, he was in the military or something along those lines. And, and Troy Graham laying these, these one liners and these promos, especially for the spot shows, the house shows and things talking about, you're going to wish you were back in Vietnam. And I'm just, I know what the hell he went through in Vietnam. Now the, the casual fan just thinks, okay, well he, he, you know, he was in the Vietnam war. I know that right. this guy was in, in, you know, tortured for eight years in Vietnam. So to say that line to me, it's like, wow, dude, I, I clearly, Troy didn't really clear any of this. He was just saying whatever no. he felt like. And luckily I'm sure Stan and Steve, Steve specifically wasn't sitting there watching any of this. So <laughs> I don't know that yeah. it would have bothered him or not. Cause some of these it, things are just, I'm like, wow, that is over the top. Can you imagine if Bill Watts had that angle and how much heat he would have put into that? You oh, know, Bill's commentary over that. Oh my God. <laughs> I can only imagine. Yes. Yes. He would have went on and on and on. Yeah. He would have, he would have sold that thing to the end of time. Yeah. That would have been some heat yeah. for sure. Yeah. A good yeah. call. That would have been really good down there in mid South. Yeah. I mean, he loved, he loved heat and here it just, it just seemed like another Memphis angle, you know, it, it did. just didn't seem like it had the impact <laughs> that it should have, but. Yeah, I, I love Fargo trying to undig dig the grave that he dug earlier. Right, <laughs> right. He should have given him a shovel and said, "Okay, no, I buried these guys before, but I'm going to undig the grave and and we're going to put some new makeup on these guys, and you're going to love them again just like you used to." You yeah, know? these these yeah. guys didn't betray you. They were just you know uh, checking the world out. Everybody's got to go out and do that, and then they come back home when they realize that there's no place like home. And yeah. uh, I love the story. I don't know what the Bahamas, what was the deal with that? But the story was uh, Jackie Fargo was in the Bahamas when the Fabs returned and they needed to call him on his vacation to get him to leave his vacation to come back to help them by <laughs> cut, cutting a promo in his, you know, I guess that's his house because it's always a striped shirt in front of that same backdrop. Anyway, every time we, it don't matter what year it is, it feels like Jackie Fargo yeah. got a promo here from, from home. Uh, I, I was looking at that. And Steve Kern just cut a promo, I think, last week where he's making fun of the interns. They're taking orders. They got to take orders from Troy Graham in order to do anything. And then Steve, you can see in his head, oh shit, we, we just brought Jackie <laughs> Fargo. So he's like, well, we don't take orders. We ask for advice. I'm like, nice try, Steve, but you didn't save no sale. So <laughs> Yeah, no. And, and your father was taking orders in the military as well. well so true that. Yeah, true that. Not, yeah. a, not a good line to go down, but yeah, definitely just a huge missed opportunity with his as good as Troy Graham was on the mic. And th- that's where they, they needed to treat this like this isn't a typical typical wrestling angle. A lot of that needed to just be storytelling done by videos and, and things like that, but it just didn't work the way Do you think did. it was just the laziness, or do you think that they really never bothered to learn the, the true history? Because, you know, you go back and Dick Kern – he was part, you know, when he was captive there in Vietnam, he was part of that. It was famous at the time, that Hanoi March, where they marched something like 50 some prisoners up the in the village trying to, you know, um, show that they've, you know, they've, they've overtaken the United States or whatnot. And then it gets out of control. And the village villagers actually all attack these guys. So these guys yeah. are, are being tortured in their prison camp. They're being tortured in the streets by civilians. So these guys went through a whole lot of stuff. And I'm just wondering if they. Never really bothered to look into all this that deep. Yeah, I, I'm guessing not. I'm guessing, you know, probably Steve and Stan just pitched this idea. Hey, our parents are in town. You know, we can do this. We did this in Florida. It was great. We made huge money. I just thought it was funny that the fathers could bother to show up, but the fabs weren't in the studio. <laughs> right. We love our boys so much. We're here to not watch them wrestle today. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, and Jackie Fargo's like, 
you know, I saw tears in their eyes and real men don't cry. But, you know, when I saw tears in their eyes, I knew something bad had happened. And I know their fathers because I played golf with them. So yeah. <laughs> it's inter interesting to see where it goes from here. I know the Fabs uh, just captured the tag titles from the interns. So we'll see how it continues to play out. But man, Troy Graham, that busted knee, it's uh, the leg injury that never healed. It seemed like really uh, very unfortunate for him because what a mouthpiece. He could have done something somewhere. Yeah, I, Cornette said that uh, that was the inspiration for the Ron Wright character in Smoky Mountain oh, Wrestling. Oh, yeah, I never never Ron, thought of that. Ron, Ron being in the in the wheelchair, sure, right, with uh, he, Tony you Anthony. You can't hit me. I'm crippled. You know, <laughs> at the same time they're you know spouting off to everybody and interfering in matches and things of that nature. But yeah, good stuff. Good stuff, man. Yeah, so there's been a lot going on in Memphis, but the best is yet to come. We've been promising everybody because it's like so far we've been talking about the Terminators and Joe Lightfoot and all these guys. And it's like in Playboy Frazier's, you know, been on TV, which is so, you know, always a boost if he gets to cut a promo because talk about underrated, man. Did Frazier not get it like he got that sports entertainment side of pro wrestling? Oh, yeah. You know, I I watched one of his matches the other day. And his back was as big as a billboard sign. And <laughs> I thought, why weren't they paying for advertisement on Playboy oh, Frazier's wow. back? Would be great. <laughs> Eddie Gilbert could have him, come here, come here, come here, Playboy. Turn around, turn around. And they could advertise or whatever that week. And Yeah, and <laughs> coming in like Toyota on the back of Playboy <laughs> Perfect, perfect. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I mean, the, the man of 3,000 gimmicks. But uh, and, and Vince McMahon picked the worst one of them all. Like, all these awesome – like, could you imagine Playboy Frazier in a tuxedo in the WWF? You're telling me that's not Vince written all over it? I mean, oh, talk about yeah. dropping the ball. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah that was, that was the, you know, in my wrestling life, seeing Playboy Frazier at that age in the WWF was just – well, the most bizarre thing. I couldn't comprehend it. Yeah, it, ha it had to be all about the size. I mean, I, I know Hillbilly went down with a knee injury, and they needed a Hillbilly, basically, yeah. in, in the interim. So I get why he was hired. I get why he got the Hillbilly gimmick, guys. Because every time I point out, I would have loved to have seen uh, Kamala 2 or Playboy Frazier or any of these other incarnations in the WWF. Everybody's like, well, he came in to replace Hillbilly. I, I know why he came in. I understand that. I'm just telling you what I would have liked to have seen. Like, you know, let him hit it rich. Let him, let him dig and hit some Arl hit some Arl and he comes, he's, you know, and he comes rich and all of a sudden he's a playboy and give him a tuxedo and you get another year out of him. He doesn't have to work. It's a great gimmick. Yeah. I don't even need to see him in the ring, you know? So yeah. it would have been great. Yeah. He would have made another year of money, but uh, he goes around yeah. selling those fake Rolex watches long enough. I guess it'll get you canned. <laughs> <laughs> hey well, Vince, I, you want to buy a Rolex? Know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if he pissed Vince off at some point or something, but Jesse Ventura tells the story that when they were doing the wedding, Vince says, bury that guy. Oh, <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> so that's when uh, Ventura came up with the line that he and his newly newly crowned wife looked like two carp going after a piece of corn in the Mississippi <laughs> River. Or something. <laughs> they were kissing. Uh, <laughs> poor plow boy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, he only got that job really because of his size. He was a what, near seven feet tall, it seemed like to me anyway. I mean, he's, he's a pretty tall dude. And then, of yeah, course, he's like freaking 500 pounds. Actually, pretty close to Andre height wise. Yeah. Pretty, pretty big dude <laughs> for, for yeah. sure. Really stuck out here in Memphis. But man, that's fun times, man. We're not too deep into the year of 85 yet, but some, just some big things coming and just happened. Jimmy Hart, Macho Man coming up, things like that, giving people an idea of what was going on behind the scenes. And I wanted to play catch up with you anyway, because I just love talking to you last time, man. It's fun. And uh, you get it, man. You know, you're, you're like a historian, but you can laugh at this stuff at the same time. You know, you get a lot of people that listen and they go, well, you made fun of my favorite hero, Jerry Lawler or Dusty Rhodes. And I, I hate you now. And it's like, no, I just, I can enjoy a character, enjoy a wrestler. Jerry Lawler, probably yeah. one of my top five to watch, or at least, you know, with the promos and whatnot and things, but I still get what, you know, what, what it was like backstage <laughs> dealing with Jerry yeah. Lawler. So I can have fun with that. I didn't work for him. So I, it doesn't piss me off any. <laughs> I, I think Memphis wrestling in, both intentionally and unintentionally had more humor than any other wrestling territory. Oh, you know, another question I wanted to ask you before we finish up here, and I don't know if you'll remember because it's kind of obscure, but it's just about to happen right now is uh, Eddie Gilbert's daddy, Tommy Gilbert, about to come back into the Memphis territory under a mask as yeah, Mr. 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 Wrestling. wrestling. Right. Yes. And 
on the very first episode, and I, I believe I've already posted it. If not, it's going up. But I encourage everybody to go over to my YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade and watch this episode. It's either last week of February, first week of March, somewhere around there. Mr. Wrestling comes into the territory. And on three occasions during that episode, both Lance and Dave, when they're speaking to him or about him, refer to him as Tommy. And I gotta, <laughs> I gotta ask you, intentional? Is it like a wink and a nod? Like, yeah, we know it's freaking Tommy Gilbert. Or is it just they're so over the silliness of trying to present Tommy Gilbert as Mr. Wrestling? It's not being taken seriously that even they are lost in the shuffle and they're just like, there's Tommy in the ring. And it's, it's hilarious that they do it not once, not twice, but three times in the same show, both Lance and Dave. Yeah, I think I think it's the old thing like this heel's trying to outsmart us, but we we, we know that, you know, it's really him. Okay. Yeah, I think it, it <laughs> like we're we're smarter than this heel. Ha 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 kind of thing, but they they did some really weird stuff with uh Tommy Gilbert in the 80s, you know, like, yeah. I they, they I think they wanted to use him but they didn't know how to anymore and he kind of aged, you know, he definitely aged out of I mean in the 70s, he was a top tag team guy. You know, he was he was viewed as one of the top baby faces in the mid 70s, but by this time it was like, okay, you know, you're you're the father of the lead heel, we want to use you in some way, but we're not going to you know, have you headlining any cards or or getting involved in any intricate storylines or anything. So I, I think it was just like kind of, here's a favor and we'll do this. And, but uh, yeah, it was really weird. I, I saw some of those interviews and, and Lanny Poffo and Joe Lightfoot are going, we know that's you, Tommy Gilbert. You're right. not fooling anyone. <laughs> so, but I mean, how much did they do to kill mass gimmicks? In Memphis, you know? Oh my God. Yeah. With the, uh, the daydreamers. I don't know if I talked to you about that. I don't know if I'd realized that before uh, we started with Gene at the beginning of the year, but the very first promo before the daydreamers even debut, uh, the nightmares are out there going, yeah, there's this new team coming to town and they're wearing masks. They're called the daydreamers. And we hear there's Steve, you know, Constance and Ashley. I'm like, why the fuck would you do that before they even make it to TV? <laughs> Yeah. So I, I don't know who okayed that or probably nobody, but I was just like, wow, talk about killing a gimmick or an angle dead. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let yeah, us figure you know, it out, you know? And then you, I, I guess the original, you know, allure of the gimmick was who is this guy and we want to figure it out and right. let's try to mask him. And then, you know, you've got every jobber wearing a mask and every team that gets beat coming back in and wearing a mask. And, you know, Lawler must have had one of the biggest mask collections in history. <laughs> he was just tossing them out like candy. Basically. It's the epic You're... boxo masks, man. I talk about it all the time. Maybe people just need a mask. There must be one sitting backstage at every arena, an arena well, near you. <laughs> here, here's a, I'll bring up this story. I know that um, David Schultz is going to be making his return, short return, pretty, pretty soon in Memphis wrestling. <laughs> <clears throat> but when we talked last time, we talked a little bit about Malden, Missouri mm -hmm. and the pr promotion, Henry Rogers. Yes. And years ago I was at a convention and David Schultz was there and I said, Hey, this is kind of strange, but I want to ask you about Malden, Missouri. And his <laughs> eyes just lit up. He's like, you know about Malden? And I said, well, I grew up in Northeast <laughs> Arkansas. And he said, Oh, it was so great. You'd work three times. You'd, you'd work the opening matches yourself, and then you'd put on a hood, and you'd work in a tag team, and then you'd work in a battle royal at the end of the night. So, yeah. so they yeah. were used to just passing masks around. Yeah, you but, would see a lot of masked names in the results for the Malden shows, and I was wondering, I wonder who these guys were, who they went on to become, but it, it was uh, that I came to the conclusion, you know what, it's probably one of these other six guys <laughs> that are on the card, right? So. Yeah, Schultz, Schultz told me that those matches were as close to a shoot as you'd ever find because nobody was really trained. Trained, yet, right, so they yeah. Just, and they were just beating the crap out of each other. But it was so funny how excited he got to talk about Malden, Missouri. It's probably been the first time he's been asked about Malden, Missouri in his life. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, so uh, yeah, it's funny. You've got this, you know, fearsome heel with that persona that you just – you know, slap the taste out of anybody's mouth that he sees. And, and he just looks like a little kid when you, you know, starts reminiscing about his yeah. early days. In wrestling. It's, it's so funny to hear about Schultz because Bob Roop, he's told this story more than once uh, about Schultz. You know, this, the segment on, on TNT with Vince where they go to Schultz's quote unquote home 
his log right, cabin right. where he's threatening to, you know, smack his wife and smack his kid. And he shoot, you know, the gun goes off, blows a hole in the ceiling and all that good stuff. Well, I guess Roop thought, you know, he knew it was planned, but he thought that was his real family. You know, like he was fooled even back then. He was like, I thought what heel he, what an asshole. And, you know, he's like when he was watching it way back when. And so he thought that was just a, I told, I told Bob, I said, that was just ahead of its time. You know, like if Vince yes. put that together or whoever's idea that was to film that. The whole thing was ahead of its time, you know. It was it was awesome. I love that segment. But right. yeah, it was, David it was Schultz, the same stuff Stone Cold would have been doing 25, 30 years later. When he could get know, away with it, thing. right. Yeah, Threat, threatening to deck kids and wives and things. Probably wouldn't right. go over so well in 2024, but back when people didn't take it seriously and it was just a you know television program, I guess you could just, what an ass. You know, David <laughs> Schultz, one of the greatest heels ever. Like, you could have done so much with that. Uh, it would have been very politically incorrect, I'm sure. But man, that dude, you know, he had some, he had some legs on him. If uh, Vince could have kept him around and just uh, controlled yeah. him a little bit. And, you know, Dave, but, he's told the story that Vince told him to smack Stossel. And we've heard the story that he was just told to, you know, don't, don't let him, you know, make wrestling look bad or whatnot too. I don't know the real story. I'm sure there, it, it's somewhere in between all of that. Um, I think he got the, you know, the shaft there. Unfortunately, somebody had to pay for the whole slapping of Stossel's ear, uh, but yeah, man, it would have been cool to see him stick around for a while and just given that that gimmick, basically, you know, because they right. would have it would have been more cartooned, right? It would have been more. Let's make you more of a, a southern asshole, just you know, backwoods mountain guy, versus go out there and have good matches with Hogan or whatever, right? So because right. it evolved into that, that would have been so much fun if they could have came up with more segments with Schultz. Oh yeah, and speaking of politically incorrect, he'll be wearing a very interesting T-shirt in, a, in one of the uh, uh, Memphis wrestling episodes. I recall coming, up, so. <laughs> so so look out for that. Oh, the heat getter. He's probably going to say Jerry Jarrett made him wear that too. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah. there you go. <laughs> well, see, I'm looking forward to '85, man. There's so many guys. It's Memphis, so there's always guys coming and going, right? You never know who's going to stop through the Memphis territory, whether they're just on their way to the next territory or they, they need a job and, and they, they really need a job. <laughs> and they go, well, I, that, I can't live off. I, this. I tell you growing up, that was legitimately part of the excitement of watching is like, who's going to show up this week. Right. You know, especially a lot of times the Lawler would bring in guys for these one-offs for main events and things like that. And it was just really exciting. Like, okay, this week, who's going to be on the card? Yeah. Know? I believe the next show we cover, there's going to be a box in the studio and everything's uh, moreover when it comes out of a box, according to Jim Cornette, the, the unfortunate <laughs> part and a spoiler alert guys, nothing comes out of this box. <laughs> oh, so let's see. I, I, I think, I think Cornette's onto something. It's like, why does Christmas get over so well? You know, because everything's in a box and you don't know what it is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's like a fake Christmas if there's nothing in the box. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have more fun with that, I'm sure, when we get to that episode, because there's plenty I can say about the entire story there. But man, it's uh, it's been a blast, dude, just kind of rehashing uh, some things that we were kind of getting into as uh, we left last time on our show that we covered together. So uh, now that a couple months of 85 are in the books, it was fun to bring you back and kind of talk about what's been going on and what's about to happen here. Yeah. And I think, like I said, I think, I think it gets much more interesting in the, in the weeks and months to come. A lot of new faces, a lot of uh, interesting booking things that are going to be happening. So it's, it's business is about to pick up. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, it won't be long. We'll have you back on here. We'll talk a little bit more about Memphis and pretty much anything else we can come up with. Uh, as, uh, you're right. always a fun guest, you know, we've, it's only been what two times now, man, but you're welcome back anytime. And it's easy, easy flowing because you know, your stuff and uh, it's just fun times. I, I enjoy anybody who wants to come on here and have a good laugh. And uh, if you can't have a good laugh at some of this stuff, then uh, you're watching it for the wrong reason. Cause <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, it's, I, I always uh, enjoy being on your program. I love, you know, all of your, your podcasts, you put so much work into them. I listen to you and Bob Roop every week, and it's just a really fascinating, you know, all the history that he was involved in that, mm -hmm. that I wasn't aware of. So so thank you for what you're doing. Oh, I appreciate it, man. Thank you, Steve, for being part of the show. We hope to have you back soon. All right. Thank you so much. Hey guys, Ray Russell here, curator of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, inviting you guys to listen to many of the programs here as part of the WrestleCopia brand, including, but not limited to, 
the Wrestling Memory Grenade, currently covering the 1988 and the WWF Project. You can also listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories, whether it's Jamie Ward with Georgia 81, Roman Gomez with the UWF in 1986, or Gene Jackson covering Memphis in 85. Three projects going on right now over there at Regional Wrestling. You can also listen to the Wrestling Stoop with the legend himself, Bob Roop. Bob goes back in time each and every week, covering not just his career, but countless stories and interactions with hundreds of wrestling names spanning his two decades in the business. But that's not all. You can also check out the Puro Wrestling Academy with the professor of Puro Resu, Mr. Dan Ginnity. Dan and I go back in time and cover the history of Japanese professional wrestling in the English language. And you can listen to all of those shows and more, all part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Pocket Cast, and beyond. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to our social media guys for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Plus, I'm constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history. You can follow us over on X, formerly Twitter, at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R A S S L I N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And why not subscribe to YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade? And of course, now would be a fantastic time to become a WrestleCopia patron. I'm talking about that $5 all access tier over at Patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. That address again, patreon.com slash wrestle C-O-P-I-A, where you get so many gifts for just five bucks, including all of my insanely detailed show notes for every episode of the Grenade Show, Regional Wrestling, and the Monday Warfare podcast. You also get early access to a lot of the podcasts here on the WrestleCopia brand, where you can listen days and sometimes as much as a week earlier than the rest of the listeners. We also offer remastered versions of the earliest episodes of The Grenade Show covering the 1989 NWA project. Includes enhanced sound quality, plus new content and conversation never heard before. But that's still not all, guys. You also get at least a dozen digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure each and every month, plus random bonus video drops, and of course, the Patreon-exclusive Watch Along series covering many past WWF and WCW events, and if that's not all, Videocast, also now a part of Patreon. And for those who like all of their podcasts in one nice, neat little pile, the WrestleCopia Patreon also offers a Patreon-exclusive Spotify account. You can actually go over to your Spotify with your WrestleCopia Patreon credentials. Instead of listening or downloading directly from Patreon, you can go over to Spotify and listen to all the latest shows, including all of the early releases. And you get all of that. And so much more for just $5. No subscription. Cancel any time. Give it a try for a month, guys. I think you'll like the content that I offer. And every penny of it goes right back here into paying the bills. So if you're looking to support that next up-and-coming podcast brand, please consider making it WrestleCopia. Help me pay some of the bills to keep the WrestleCopia podcast network and all of the great shows here up and running for the months and the years to come. All right, well, I was expecting a great conversation there, but that actually exceeded my expectations. It's been a while. It's so easy to talk to Steve. He gets it. We can go through wrestling history and have a little fun in the process. And uh, speaking of having fun with the Memphis wrestling territory, you guys know we do that each and every time out as we cover the 1985 and the CWA, the Memphis Wrestling Project. And of course, you guys know by now who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the man. He's no stranger to this program. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, Gene Jackson. What's up, Ray? How's it going, man? What's going on? Well, I figured it would be, you know, we ended the interview a little short here with Steve Crawford. We had some time left on the show, so I figured who better to fill a Memphis episode of Regional Wrestling than Mr. Gene Jackson himself? Well, I appreciate it, man. I enjoyed the interview with Steve, as always. Uh, You know, you guys uh, filled in some holes and answered some questions that, you know, you and I had about 1985 and... He's the he's the go to guy, right? I mean, he's he's the one that has answered quite a few questions, including the the burning question about Jerry Clower. So uh, <laughs> it's always good to get Steve's input, right? The closer, 
Steve Crawford. There you go. <laughs> I like right. it. I like it. Yeah, so uh, I wanted you on this episode. We're not going to go back to 1985 this week. This week, uh, I brought you on the show because I wanted to discuss the new upcoming podcast we have planned. Actually, it's dropping this week, the very first episode, the Retro Wrestling Review Show. Gene, why don't you tell them a little bit about it? Man, I'm super excited. So, like, once me and you got going on uh, regional wrestling and we got to talk about Memphis 1985 and was having such a great time doing that, really got me in the mood to to watch, you know, more Memphis wrestling. So not only was I checking out 85, but I kind of jumped ahead and was watching some USWA from the 90s. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me, as like, man, you know, there's there's quite a few podcasts out there that talk about different points in the 80s and a lot of the CWA era of Memphis, but there's just not a lot of coverage out there and a lot of history on uh, the USWA, the 90s era, and uh, it's it's one that I have a lot of fond memories of, and I was like, well, if there's not one, let's create it, you know what I mean? Uh, why not me, right? So uh, I knew that, you know, you had a lot on your plate, my lord, um, you know, you've got so so many podcasts going. I <laughs> thought, man, uh, you know, I know I know a few different people who are uh, Memphis fans and, yeah. and have some knowledge of, of Memphis wrestling from inside and out. And so I reached out to them. And so I got a couple of buddies of mine that they got a podcast, P3 Radio, that's a mixture of you know wrestling and comedy and uh, Richard Mulliken and Josh Briley. And, you know, they're going to be joining me. Uh, I've already got them the first couple episodes recorded with them. And those guys are great. They're funny. They've got insight. They're not afraid to express their opinions. But I've got some other people in the works as well. Uh, and, and a couple who are, are familiar to the Russell Copia audience. And, and, you know, I'm sure uh, I'm sure even you may uh, tag in when there's time. We've talked about that. So, yeah, what a, what a fun to year get to, going, to get going with. Yeah, USWA 1993. That was the year of the WWF USWA crossover where Vince was sending talent over because Jerry Jarrett was working for Vince at the time, perhaps going to replace Vince had he went to prison is the way the story goes, <laughs> unless you ask Bruce Pritchard. Uh, but obviously, yeah. obviously Vince doesn't. But during most of 1993, we're going to see all sorts of WWF talent travel through the USWA. Uh, from the return of the Macho Man Randy Savage to the Giant Gonzalez, Brett the Hitman Hart, even Lex Luger, who seems really out of place in the Memphis studio, he's going to arrive there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I kind of pondered this for a couple of weeks because I was like, well, you know, USWA actually started in 1990. Uh, and so I talked it over with you and a couple other people, and I was kicking around where to kick this off because, uh, you know, this is going to follow a very similar format to what we do on the 1985 uh, podcast. Other than there is one glaring difference, there's going to be two versions. There's going to be the audio version, and there's also going to be the video version that's going to be going up over on the uh, Wrestling Memory Grenade YouTube channel. So, you know, you can you can watch video clips or you can just listen to it. It's going to work on on both levels. And uh, we decided that if you're trying to get people interested in a USWA podcast, like you just said, what better year to start with than 1993? Uh, you start out with all this uh, mean Mike Miller and Jerry Lawler uh, <laughs> nonsense at the beginning. Burt Prentice accusing Miss Texas of actually being a, a man named Bubba Johnson. <laughs> there's there's a lot to uh, to unpack in the in the first two or three months, but once we get into February, man, the WWF guys start rolling in, and uh, you know it's not just it's not just the lower card guys. You know, as we roll on through the year, man, we're going to see Brett the Hitman Hart, we're going to see Owen Hart, we're going to see the Undertaker, Bigelow, we're going to see a lot of big names coming through Memphis and it's it's really fun like you said to see Lex Luger in the TV5 studio how odd is that it's our first look at a heel Vince McMahon absolutely that you know I almost jumped to 94 just because when that's when we really dig into that uh, but we'll get there we'll get there I, I'm, I'm planning on seeing this thing through because there's great stuff in 94 great stuff in 95 96. Uh, but yes, man, that is where the you original left out ninety-seven. Gene. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know that. Uh, I don't know that I'll live long enough to ever want to do USWA ninety-seven. That'll probably be a one-episode recap of yeah, this happened and then it went to hell. Uh, but you were you were saying I, I didn't mean to cut you off the uh, the <laughs> in, original incarnation of uh, I guess you're going to say heel Vince there. 
yeah, of heel Vince. Uh, I remember in that time frame of having only seen, you know, Vince McMahon on WWF TV and seeing this heel version of Vince McMahon, you know, talking down to Memphis and talking down to the Jerry Lawler. And it was so, it was so much fun. And you got to think that, you know, maybe in the back of, of Vince McMahon's mind, he had always kind of thought, oh, it wouldn't it be fun to be a heel? Mm. But, I mean, you got to think that this this time in the USWA is what showed him, like, I could do this. This could this could be a thing. And right. when it yeah. presented itself, you know, there's probably no bigger feud in wrestling history than Stone Cold versus Mr. McMahon. And I don't think that happens if you don't have heel Vince McMahon in the USWA in Memphis. So it definitely you know. gave him a practice run trial run there to see kind of what, what to do, what not to do. And uh, I think he basically hit it out of the park right out of the gate here in 93. Hopefully everybody can go back. They're going to be able to enjoy that with you because like you said, it's not just a, an audio podcast, but it's going to be a video cast on YouTube at youtube.com slash wrestling grenade. Make sure you guys subscribe today. So you don't miss those going to drop every week, every Wednesday, I do believe Gene. And, uh, man, it's uh, going to be a good time. You're going to be there with who knows what and as far as special guests go and co-hosts and all that great stuff. But also some video clips every once in a while going to be thrown in. Hopefully the Vince promos, obviously, will be there. Uh, but, yeah, it's going to be a great time, guys. Uh, encourage everybody to uh, subscribe now to YouTube and check every Wednesday for the podcast as well. If you're driving around, you can listen to it on, the, uh, on your phone or whatnot. And if you're uh, sitting around at home, hey, pop up the video. And uh, you can, guys can obviously watch YouTube on any uh, streaming device you have. So uh, whether it's even your Roku TV, I'm, I've got it on in front of me right now. I don't know that my kids are going to want to watch that, but uh, I'll tune them on to the, uh, the original heel Vince McMahon. We'll see what happens. <laughs> well, I won't hold that against them, but uh, there, there's better things to watch on TV than, than me. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, uh, and also these full episodes that we're going to be reviewing, uh, I have a YouTube channel as well, and those full episodes of pretty much every available USWA television episode from 1990 through 97 that I could possibly find and get my hands on are on that channel. So we'll awesome. be sharing the links to those each week as well. So you can you can go back, you can watch the whole episode if you like. You can watch our take on it and uh, get on the uh, Ray's Facebook, the Wrestling Memory Grenade Facebook. We've mm -hmm. got a Facebook retro wrestling review you can't put that dash in there so it's just facebook.com slash retro wrestling review and we'll be sharing things there as well and come interact with us man let us know what you think of the show uh give us your thoughts on uh, what you like what you don't like what your opinions are of the actual uswa show and what you like about the podcast because you know i figure this is gonna be a work in progress like i say we're kind of pattering it after you know what we've done with regional wrestling mm -hmm. At the show, but as we go, uh, we may see we have to make a few minor adjustments, and I would love to have everybody's feedback to to figure out if we're heading in the right direction, and if not, where we need to be headed. Well, being the curator of the WrestleCopia brand, I got a sneak peek at the first episode, and I encourage everybody to be sure to check in this week and uh, watch it because it was a fun time, man. For a uh, pilot episode, man, you guys did a great job, and like you said, your co-host for this uh, initial episode, and I guess for uh, episode number two. Very engaging guys. These guys have a lot to say, and it, it makes the show uh, far more entertaining than, than uh, we've seen a lot of shows where people are just kind of, they're there, and they, they don't mind uh, being there, but they're not necessarily involved, and these guys were certainly involved, and you guys had a great conversation, and I'm, I'm looking forward to more along the way, guys, but uh, be sure to check it out this week. The Retro Wrestling Review makes its debut as part of the WrestleCopia brand, and it's, it's a great time as we kick off the first week of January 1993. At the USWA. Thank you, Gene, so much for joining us here this week to talk just a little bit about the brand new show with your host, Gene Jackson. Thanks for having me, man. And uh, I appreciate everybody listening. And uh, I can't wait to get everybody's feedback. All right. And that'll wrap it up here this week. But the fun continues on more Georgia 81, UWF 86, Memphis 85. And of course, I'm your host, Ray Russell, encouraging you to follow me on X at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R A S S L I N Grenade. And don't forget to subscribe to patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. So many good gifts out there, guys. And until next time, we'll see you soon for some more regional wrestling where we talk the territories. Mm -hmm.